I want to start out by uh, thanking uh, Professor Nicholsberg Nichols for teaching us here today and for his unparalleled contributions on the book of First Enoch and throughout the Enoch literature. I um, also uh, want to thank those who presented so far today, including some who've delved much deeper into uh, Enoch than I have done. Today I'm going to I think, I think the order between Dave, my talk and David's is, is probably fortuitous because I'm going to start out by talking a little bit about the LDS Book of Moses, or Extracts from the Prophecy of Enoch, as Joseph Smith called it, to set that in its context, and then get somewhat into the exaltation of Enoch and the Son of Man issues that somewhat touch on some of the issues in, in First Enoch. David is going to have a very interesting talk because he's going to bring together some themes from the LDS Book of Enoch and tie those together to some of the Enoch traditions that uh, go into the heavenly ascent issues that uh, Professor Nicholsberg touched on. So in this presentation, I'm going to uh, describe how the LDS Book of Enoch can be understood as the culminating story of a temple text, ritually understood and transmitted as part of temple liturgy, liturgy in the LDS tradition. And the reason I'm qualifying that is I'm making no claims today about ancient uh, Judaism in terms of a temple liturgy. But if you understand the story and you understand something about the uh, temple tradition in LDS thought, you'll see how it plays the role of a temple text. I'll also show how the story of Enoch provides a paradigm of discipleship for the Latter-day Saints, demonstrating that those who wish to follow the path of Enoch must take upon themselves his suffering as well as his glory. The LDS account of Enoch has been called the most remarkable religious document published in the 19th century. It was produced early in Joseph Smith's ministry, in fact, in the same year as the publication of the Book of Mormon, as part of a divine commission to retranslate the Bible. Writing the account of Enoch occupied a part of the prophet's attention for a month from 30th November to 31st December 1830. Later, the first eight chapters of the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis, and I should say by translation, we're not meaning going back to the ancient languages, we're talking about the use of Joseph Smith's prophetic gifts. That uh, book of Moses, those first eight chapters, included two chapters on Enoch, which were separately canonized as the book of Moses. There's other Enoch material elsewhere in Joseph Smith's revelations, but we won't focus on those today. Though the Joseph Smith translation was not published in its entirety during Joseph Smith's lifetime, his revelations make clear the urgency of the task of translation itself. Why was this so? A careful study of the history of Joseph Smith's effort provides clues that may provide a partial answer to this question. His focus is made clear by an examination of the overall translation results and schedule. For example, a close look at the number of verses modified in the translation processes show that a clear priority was accorded to the book of Genesis, especially the first 24 chapters. Although we see at left that Genesis constitutes only 5-3% of the page count of the Bible, we see at right that it accounted for 20% of the changes made by Joseph Smith. Strikingly, more than half the change verses in the Joseph Smith translation Old Testament are contained in Moses 1 and Genesis. As a proportion of page count, changes in Genesis occur four times more frequently than in the New Testament, and 21 times more frequently than in the rest of the Old Testament. The changes in Genesis are not only more numerous, but also more significant in the degree of doctrinal and historical expansion. Looking at it from the perspective of translation time rather than the number of revised verses, the same picture holds. By mid-1833, three years after the process of translation started, an initial manuscript had been completed. At left, we see that Genesis 1 through 24 constitutes 1% of the Bible by page count. At right, we see the proportion of known durations of periods when each part of the translation was completed, with the first 24 chapters in Genesis occupying nearly a quarter of the total translation time for the entire Bible. Though we cannot know how much time Joseph Smith's daily schedule at the translation occupied during each phase of the process, it's obvious that Genesis 1 through 24, the first 1% of the Bible, must have received a significantly more generous share of the prophet's time and attention than did the remaining 99%. What important things could Joseph Smith have learned from translating 1 through Genesis 1 through 24? To begin with, the story of Enoch and its righteous city would have had pressing relevance to the mission of the church as the prophet worked to help the saints understand the law of consecration and to establish Zion in Missouri, uh, patterned after the community that Enoch established in the book of Moses. Thus, it is no coincidence that the first part of this account was published in 1832. 
In addition, though, the first uh, early JST ch Genesis chapters also relate the stories of the other patriarchs, especially Adam, Noah, Melchizedek, and Abraham. In consideration of this fact and other evidence from the revelations and teachings of the Spirit that I won't be able to go into today, I've come to believe that the most significant impact of the translation process may have been early tutoring in temple-related doctrines received by Joseph Smith as he revised and expanded Genesis 1 through 24 in conjunction with his later translation of relevant passages in the New Testament and, for example, references to prophets such as Moses and Elijah. A corollary in making this argument is that a detailed understanding of the covenants and sequences of blessings associated with current forms of LDS temple worship may have been revealed to Joseph Smith more than a decade before he began to teach them in plainness to the saints in Nauvoo. It's been generally supposed that in Kirtland the prophet knew only a little bit about temple ordinances and taught, taught all of what he then knew to the saints. And that when he got to the Nauvoo, he learned more and, and taught the rest. However, I think such a conclusion is mistaken. My study of the Book of Moses and other of the initial revelations and teachings of Joseph Smith have convinced me that he knew early on much more about these matters than he taught publicly, contradicting the view of those who consider the temple ordinances a late invention. Indeed, in a few cases, we know that the prophet deliberately delayed the publication of early temple-related revelations connected with his work on the JST until the later, later Nauvoo period. For example, Dan Bachman, sitting over here, has convincingly argued that nearly all of De Doctrine and Covenants 132, a section describing celestial marriage and, and, and priesthood keys of temple sealing, was revealed to the prophet as he worked on the first half of JST Genesis. This was more than a decade pre previous to 1843 when the revelation was shared with Joseph Smith's close associates. Likewise, Joseph Smith waited until 1843 to publish the first chapter of Moses. In that revelation, he'd been specifically commanded not to show it, quote, unto any except them that believe until I command you. Even after Joseph Smith was well along in Bible translation process, he seems to have believed that God did not intend for him to publish the JST. Writing to W.W. Phelps in 1832, and this is an excerpt from the letter I'm going to read, Joseph Smith said, I would inform you that the Bible translation will not go from under my hand during my natural life for re correction, revision, or printing and the word of the Lord be done. Although in later years, Joseph Smith reversed his position and apparently made serious efforts to prepare the manuscript of the JST for publication, his own statement makes it clear that initially he did not feel authorized to share publicly all that he'd produced and learned during the Bible translation process. Some of what the prophet learned as he worked on the JST and other translation projects may have never been put to writing. Brigham Young is remembered as stating that the prophet before his death spoke about going through the translation of the scriptures again and perfecting it upon points of doctrine which the Lord had restrained him from giving in plainness and fullness at the time. Within a Mormon temple ritual called the endowment, a narrative relating to selected events of primeval history provides the context for the presentation of divine laws and the making of covenants. Because the book of Moses, in which the greatest portion of Joseph Smith's revelations of Enoch are to be found, is the most detailed account of primeval history found in the LDS canon, we should not be surprised to find that it contains a similar pattern where sacred history is interleaved with covenant-making themes. Arguing that these covenant-making themes help dictate both the structure and content of the material selected for inclusion in the Book of Moses, Mark Johnson observed, throughout the, quote, throughout the text of the Book of Moses, the author stops the historic portions of the story and weaves into the narrative framework Ritual acts such as sacrifice and sacrament ordinances, such as baptism, washings, gift of the Holy Ghost, oaths and covenants such as obedience, marital obligations, and oaths of property consecration. If we assume that materials similar to Moses 1-8 through 8 might have served as a temple text, it would be expected that as this history was recited, acts, ordinances, and ceremonies would have been performed during this reading. For instance, during the story of Enoch in his city of Zion, which we'll hear about shortly from David, Members of the attending congregation would be put under oath to be a chosen covenant people and to keep all things in common with her property belonging to the Lord. A precedent for this idea is the idea of, uh, for the idea of structuring key scriptural accounts to be consistent with the pattern of covenant making can be found in Jack Welch's analysis of 3rd Nephi 11 through 18, uh, where he argued that, quote, the commandments are not only in the same order as the main commandments, always issued at the temple, but they appear largely in the same order, 
obedience and sacrifice, evil speaking of the brethren, chastity and a higher understanding of marriage and divorce, love for one's enemies and obedience to the law of love or the law of the gospel, and alms to the poor and consecration of one's life to the worship and service of God. In a similar vein, David Noel Friedman argues for an opposite pattern of covenant breaking in the primary history of the Old Testament. It is argued that the biblical record was deliberately structured to reveal a sequence where each of the commandments was broken one by one. Quote, a pattern of defiance of the covenant with God that inexorably leads to the downfall of the nation of Israel. Book by book, the violation of the first nine of the Ten Commandments are charted one by one. This hidden trail of sin betrays the house, betrays the hand of a master editor who skillfully wove into Israel's history a message to the community in the Babylonian exile that their faith is not a result of God's abandoning them, but a consequence of their abandonment of God, end of quote. This table illustrates the progressive separation of the two ways due to analogous sequences of covenant keeping and covenant breaking highlighted in the book of Moses. Specifics about these sequences are discussed in greater detail elsewhere. An interesting aspect of looking at the history of Adam through Enoch as a temple text in LDS tradition is that like the great sermons of Jesus Christ in the biblical text of the primary history, this series of covenant-related themes unfolds in what appears to be a definite order of progression. Also remarkable is that both the ultimate consequences of covenant keeping as well as those of covenant breaking are fully illustrated at the conclusion of the account in the final two chapters of the book of Moses. In the final two chapters of the book of Moses, Enoch and his people are taken up to walk in the presence of God while the wicked are destroyed in the great flood. In the remainder of this paper, we'll take up temple themes from the last chapters of the book of Moses in greater detail, focusing on the exaltation of Enoch and his people. In a seminal article relating to the story of Noah, the Genesis scholar Ronald Hendel makes the case that one of the most prominent themes of the first 11 chapters of the Bible is a series of transgressions of boundaries that have been set up in the beginning to separate mankind from the dwelling place of, place of divinity. Likewise, Robert Oden highlighted the human aspirations to divine status as an underlying theme in all these stories, and the fact that such status is ultimately denied them. The general thesis is far good as far as it goes. In the stories of the transgressions of Adam and Eve, of Cain and Lamech, of the sons of God who married the daughters of men, and the builders of the Tower of Babel, we cannot fail to observe the, the common thread of a God who places strict boundaries between the human and the divine. Surprisingly, however, a uh, significant and opposite theme has been largely neglected by exegetes, namely the fact that within some of these same chapters, God is also portrayed as having sought to erase the divine human boundary for a righteous few, drawing them into his very presence. The prime examples of this motif are, of course, Enoch and Noah, of whom it was explicitly said that they walked with God. Indeed, transcending his status in the pseudepigraphal literature as a king and priest, Noah is portrayed in the Bible as a type of God himself. Consider, for example, the microcosmic art that Noah forms and fills with living creatures and food in imitation of the creator God. And his role as captain of the ark as it moved upon the face of the waters, the, the language in Genesis chapter 1 and, and in Noah is exactly the same, assuming the role of God in the original creation of the earth. Recall also Noah's planning of an Eden-like garden after the emergence of dry land. His later locus in the midst of the most sacred place in that garden is pronouncement of a curse upon Canaan, the serpent who is responsible for the transgression of its sacred boundary. Noah's high standing in the eyes of God can be compared with that of Enoch, who is the only other mortal in scripture specifically said to have walked with God, meaning some claim that these two patriarchs attained eternal life while still in mortality. Indeed, Enoch and Noah, whose names are mentioned together three times in, this, um, three times in the story of the flood, are the only two included in the genealogical list of the patriarchs whose deaths are not mentioned. Both found life amidst the curse of death. Both were rescued from death by the hand of God, and each in his turn became a rescuer to others at least in the case of the Enoch in the book of Moses. Depictions of Noah in early Christian catacombs, like the one shown here, show him rising out of the ark in a pose of resurrection, prefiguring the emergence of Jesus Christ from the tomb. Within the book of Moses, the stories of rescue and, evalu and exaltation, the accounts of Noah and Enoch, share a common motif of water. On the one hand, Noah's waters are the waters of destruction, the floods of an all-consuming de deluge that cleanses the earth in a prelude to a new creation. 
On the other hand, Enoch's waters are the waters of sorrow, the bitter tears that precede the terrible annihilating storm. Indeed, in the vision of Enoch and Joseph Smith's revelations, there is not one but three distinct parties that weep for the wickedness of mankind, God, the heavens, and Enoch himself. In addition, a fourth party, the earth mourns, though, this, though it does not specifically weep for her children. Daniel Peterson has discussed the interplay among the members of this chorus of weeping voices, citing the arguments of non-biblical scholar, non-LDS biblical scholar, J.G.M. Roberts, that identify three similar voices within the laments of the book of Jeremiah. The feminine voice of the mother of the people, which corresponds in the book of Moses to the voice of the earth, the mother of men, as it calls it. The voice of the people, corresponding in the book of Moses to Enoch, and the voice of God himself. With respect to the weeping of God, the relevant passage in the Book of Mormon, Book of Moses, begins as follows. Quote, and it came to pass that the God of heaven looked upon the residue of the people, and he wept. And Enoch said unto the Lord, How is it that thou canst weep, seeing that thou art holy from all eternity to all eternity? The Lord said unto Enoch, Behold these thy brethren, they are the workmanship of mine own hands, and I gave them my no their knowledge in the day I created them. And in the garden of Eden gave I unto man his agency. And unto thy brethren have I said and also given commandment that they should love one another, that they should choose me their father. But behold, they are without affection, and they hate their own blood. Because of its eloquent rebuke of the idea of divine impassibility, the notion that God does not suffer pain or distress, this passage that speaks to the voice of the weeping God has received the greatest share of attention in LDS scholarship compared to the other voices of weeping in the book of Moses. Recently, a book relating to this topic has been written by Terrell and Fiona Givens. They eloquently summarize the significance of this passage as follows. It is not the wickedness of humankind, but their misery, not their disobedience, but their suffering, that elicits the God of heaven's tears. Not until Gethsemane and Golgotha does the scripture record reveal so unflinchingly the costly investment of God's love in his people, the price at which he placed his heart upon them. In the vision of Enoch, we find ourselves drawn to a God who prevents all the pain he can, assumes all the suffering he can, and weeps over the misery he can neither prevent nor assume, end of quote. In both the book of Moses and the pseudepigraphal book of First Enoch, we also find Enoch weeping in response to the visions of mankind's wickedness, not only God, but Enoch. However, whereas in First Enoch, the prophet weeps alone, the book of Moses invites us to reflect on the sympathetic union of Enoch and God and their sorrows. The weeping of Enoch is not really significant in its own right, but also because, according to Terrell and Fiona Givens, it is an illustration of, quote, what the actual process of acquiring the divine nature required. Enoch is raised to a perspective from which he sees the world through God's eyes. In Moses 7.41, we read, And it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Enoch and told Enoch all the doings of the children of men, Wherefore Enoch knew and looked upon their wickedness and their misery and wept and stretched forth his arms and his heart swelled wide as eternity and his bowels yearned and all eternity shook. The idea of raising the prophet to a level approaching godhood through shared sorrow with the divine is explored at length by theologian Terence Fretheim. Fretheim argues that the prophet's sympathy with the divine pathos was not merely the result not merely con contemplating the divine, but instead of the result of the prophet's elevation, to become a member of the divine council, as we read in other pseudepigraphal literature. Fretheim writes, The fact that the prophets are said to be part of this council indicates something of the intimate relationship they had with God. The prophet was somehow drawn up into the very presence of God. Even more, the prophet was in some sense admitted into the history of God. The prophet becomes a party to the divine story and the heart and mind of, the, of God pass over to the prophets to such an extent that the prophet becomes a veritable embodiment of God. Not surprising then in the aftermath of Enoch's soul-stretching emulation of divine pathos in the book of Moses is that the weeping prophet is given a right to the divine throne. Says Joseph Smith's Enoch to God, Thou hast given me a right to thy throne. The book of Moses' motif of grandee access to the divine throne is nowhere more at home than in the pseudepigraphal Enoch literature. For example, in Third Knee Enoch, Enoch declares, The Holy One, blessed be he, made for me a throne like the throne of glory, and sat me down upon it. Summarizing the other ancient literature relevant to this passage, Charles Mopsett concludes that the exaltation of Enoch is not meant to be seen as a singular event. Rather, he writes that the enthronement of Enoch, quote, 
The enthronement of Enoch is a prelude to the translation of the righteous, and at their head the Messiah in the world to come, a transfiguration which is the restoration of the figure of the perfect man, end of quote. Following that ideological trajectory to its full extent, Mormons see the perfect man with a capital M into whose form the Messiah and Enoch and all the righteous are transfigured as God the Father of whom Adam, the first mortal man, is a type. Fittingly, as part of Joseph Smith's account of Enoch's vision, God proclaims his primary identity to be that of an, quote, endless and eternal man, declaring, quote, man of holiness is my name. Given the identity of God the Father, as man of holiness, the title son of man, which is a notable fig feature of the book of parables, which we heard about earlier. and also appears in marked density throughout the book of Moses, vision of Enoch, is perfectly intelligible within LDS theology. So are the related titles of chosen one, anointed one, the righteous one, that appear prominently both in first Enoch and in the LDS Enoch story. After considering the sometimes contentious debate among scholars about the single or multiple reference to their, these titles in the relationship to other texts, Nicholsberg and Vanderkam conclude that the author of First Enoch, like the author of, First Moses, of, of the Book of Moses, quote, saw the traditional figures as having a single referent and applied the various designations and characteristics as seemed appropriate to him, end of quote. As Mopsik observed, However, the story does not end here. Recall his conclusion that the enthronement of Enoch is a prelude to the transfiguration of the righteous in the world to come. Indeed, in one of Joseph Smith's revelations, this idea is made explicit in the concept that these righteous will be ordained, quote, after the order of Melchizedek, which was after the order of Enoch, which was after the order of the only begotten son. Wherefore, as it is written, they are gods, even the son of God, end of quote. Unlike priesthood ordinations performed by man, the ordinance that conveys this power is administered directly by God himself, just as this status was conferred upon Enoch as part of his heavenly ascent. We are told in JST Genesis that the high priesthood, after the order of the covenant which God made with Enoch, quote, was delivered unto men by the calling of God's own voice in the heavenly temple, as it were. In another of Joseph Smith's revelations, we are told that God's, all of God's earthly children are called, in essence, sons of man making explicit the role of the Son of Man as a forerunner for the sons of man, the resurrected Jesus Christ varies this statement slightly in the Book of Mormon. Therefore, I would that you should be perfect, even as I, or your Father in heaven, is perfect. In his insightful discussion of the Greek word teleos, translated perfect, in Matthew, Jack Welch writes, quote, In commanding the people to be perfect, even as I, your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect, it seems that Jesus had several things in mind besides perfection, as we usually think of it. Whatever he meant, it involved the idea of becoming like God, even as I or your Father, which is in heaven, which occurs by seeing God and knowing God. These ultimate realities can be represented ceremonially in this world, for as Joseph Smith taught, is through the ordinances of the temple that we are instructed more perfectly. The last statement brings us to the subject of Enoch and his temple. Cunibaly cites Kako as saying that Enoch is in the center of studies and matters dealing with initiation in the literature of Israel. Enoch is the great initiate who becomes the great initiator. The Hebrew book of Enoch has the title of Hekalot, referring to the various chambers or stages of initiation in the temple. Enoch, having reached the final stage, becomes Metatron to initiate and guide others. I will not say um, that Enoch... But what, Enoch had temples and officiated there and said Brigham Young, but we have no account of it. Today we have such accounts. Coming up to the conclusion here. In line with the theme of Enoch, as a forerunner in the transfiguration of the righteous, is the book of Moses' idea that Enoch succeeded in bringing a whole people to be sufficiently pure in heart to fully live the law of consecration. In Zion, the city of holiness, the people were of one heart, quote, of one heart and one mind, and dwelled in righteousness, and there were no poor among them. We are told that not only Enoch, but all his people walked with God, and they were eventually taken into heaven with him. This will be treated extensively by David Larson in his presentation. In LDS temples, the pro promise of being received into God's own bosom, like Enoch, and his people is extended to all those who prepare themselves to receive it through the sanctifying power of Jesus Christ, one of Joseph Smith's revelations identifies Zion with a pure in heart. And just as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, the reward of the pure of heart, pure in heart, is that they shall see God. Quote, quoting one of Joseph Smith's revelations, Therefore, sanctify yourselves that your minds may become single to God, 
and the days will come that you shall see him as he is. For he will unveil his face to you, and it shall be in his own time, in his own way, and according to his own will. Remember this great and last promise which I have made unto you. Conclusion. In the recent discussion of Mormon theology, Stephen Webb concludes that Joseph Smith knew more about, quote, knew more about theology and philosophy than it was reasonable for anyone in his position to know, as if he were dip, dipping into the deep collective unconscious of Christian and Christianity with a very long pen, end of quote. More significantly, the prophet recovered a story of Enoch that manifests a deep understanding of what it becomes, what it means to become a partaker of the divine nature, and in that process to become a partner with God himself in the salvation and exaltation of his children, being raised to a perspective by which we see the world through God's eyes. The Enoch chapters in the book of Moses teach us that those who wish to follow the path of Enoch, which is the same path that was followed by the great Redeemer, must take upon themselves its sufferings with its glory. One is obliged, writes Eugene Sage, to become not only one flesh with Christ, but also one life, one sacrifice, thus participating actively in the eternal act of love which began in the heavens. Thank you.